In this video, we're going to take a look at another one of the challenges that are made for Integrity's Lead Up Live CTF. It's a pwn challenge called Format Store, and the description says, Welcome to the Format Store. It's kind of like heaven formats. Maybe you've got an idea from the name of the challenge what this is about, but let's jump over to my Parrot VM and we're going to take a look at the binary. So this is a fairly easy pwn challenge as far as they go. Most of the challenges that I made for the CTF were on the easy side, and I wanted to make sure there was a good mix of difficulties. I think it's quite difficult to get that right and make sure you've got the right mix of categories, but also of difficulties. And it's the first CTF that I've organized. So I'm not too sure if I got the balance right. I guess we'll see from the feedback afterwards. But let's jump into the challenge anyway. So we've got a file called floor mats. The first thing we might want to do is run file on it and see what type of file it is. So there's a few things here which may be of interest to us as we're trying to solve a pwn challenge. The first thing to note is that it's 64-bit binary. It's dynamically linked, which basically just means it's going to use linked functions, which are in libc, so like printf and puts and things like that, rather than just being included in the source code of this challenge. It's going to reach out to our libc library on our system whenever it needs to call those functions. We can also see that it's not stripped, so this means if we want to disassemble it in Geardra or Ida Pro or something, we should be able to recover the function names and it'll make it a little bit easier to debug. We've also got pi is enabled, so this is a binary protection. In fact, the other check we might do here is see what binary protections are enabled. In case you haven't really done any binary exploitation challenges before, let me just try and give some background on these. So what does this mean, the pi enabled? Basically, each time the program loads, it's going to have a different base address for the program. So although the offsets will be the same, so like from one function to another function, there'll always be that same distance between them. The base address won't stay the same. So if you're doing a buffer overflow and you need to be able to find functions, it means you're going to have to find out what that base address is, maybe by doing some kind of leak. The next one is NX is enabled, which means... Basically, you can't expect to inject shellcode onto the stack and for it to execute. So um, this is also known as data execution prevention. And stack can errors are found. So this is another buffer overflow protection. Basically, there will be some little random can errors that are put onto the stack so that if we do overflow the buffer and try to overwrite the return address, changing the flow of execution, then this canary being overwritten with an incorrect value will cause the program to crash. It'll come up with a message like stack smashing was detected, and then that's it. So if we were doing a buffer overflow, we'd also need to leak this canary or find some way to get the correct canary. Maybe we can brute force it as well. And partial rel row, so this is to do with the writability of the global offset table and sections in the program. Again, it might affect us if we're doing some kind of binary exploitation challenge where we want to be able to overwrite something in one of those program sessions. And again, we have the architecture here as well, which we saw up here. So there's some redundancy in what we're seeing, but this can give us a good idea what the challenge might entail. So yeah, maybe there's a buffer overflow and we have to get past all of these protections, or maybe because these protections are all enabled, it's a hint that the buffer overflow isn't gonna be the intended solution. All right, hopefully I explained that okay. It's been a while since I did any pwn videos or like pwn challenges or anything really. Um, the next thing we might want to do then is run the program, see what's actually, what the functionality is like. So we run it, we've got a message saying, welcome to the floor mat store. It's kind of like heaven for mats, which was the description that we saw on CTFD as well. Please choose from our currently available floor mats and it tells us that out of stock items have been delisted. So we've got five mats that we can choose from. Let's maybe, I mean, we could try and put in, if this was, was a buffer overflow challenge, you might try and put in a long input. There's no point in even really trying that here because even if there is a buffer overflow, we'll get the stack smashing detected. But maybe there isn't a buffer overflow and it's only grabbing the amount of data that will fit into the buffer. So I'm just going to do it as normal. I'm going to just say one and then ask for a shipping address. Again, if this was a buffer overflow, maybe we would try that again. I'm hoping you might have realized from the challenge name and description what this challenge entails, and that is a format string vulnerability. So you're not gonna know that from if you've never done one of these challenges before, but it basically means that if we were to just go and try some values in here, and I'm gonna do that now, 
you see it's come back with some hex values. And basically what we asked there is to print out these pointers. And it's going through each element on the stack and trying to print them out. Some of them are nil, and then others we actually have some values. These look like memory addresses that might be like libc. Sometimes you see challenges where you need to get a libc address, and this would be a good place to start from. And we can also do some other formats. So let me just quickly open up a link. So if you're interested in this as well, I have done a series on binary exploitation, which covers format string vulnerabilities and in a bit more depth than we'll cover in this video. I like this article from Vicky Lee. This helps me whenever I was learning about format string vulnerabilities. And you can see that they've done something similar to what we did there. So they've printed out percentage X and that is going to print it out in hex format. We did percentage P, which will basically do the same thing, but it will give us a 64 bit address instead of a32. In fact, let me just go and demonstrate that. So we can do percentage x. Let's do one. Okay, the second one was nil. So let's do a couple of percentage x, a couple of percentage p. And we'll have a look at some other ones in a second. But here you go. That's basically given us the hex values. But as you can see, it's not given us the full length either. And we can also specify the index element. So let's say you might come across a challenge where you can do this, but you've only got like 20 characters that you can enter in. Maybe it's just looking for a name instead of a shipping address. And in that case, you've got a very limited amount of characters you can use here, and you might want to access the hundredth element. So you can't do percentage P a hundred times because you've only got 20 characters. But what you can do is say percentage, and then let's say a hundred, and then dollar P, and that will print the hundredth element off the stack. You can also do some other cool things with these format string vulnerabilities, not just reading, but you can actually write data to the stack as well using the percentage n specifier. Again, I have a video on that, so I'll not go through that. It's not required for this challenge. Um, but this article is good if you just want to quickly get an understanding of how these work. And let me also just open up, we can go and get a list of what potential format specifiers we might want to use. So I'm just going to open up this link tutorials point and this gives us a list of different specifiers. So we can use these various different ones to print out in different formats if we want like an integer or something like that. We can also do a string but this one is interesting because uh, let me minimize that. If we run this again and say let's do one again percentage s we do this a few times and we actually get segmentation fault and the reason being it's not trying to print the element on the stack as a string. It's trying to, it's reading this as a pointer. So it's basically, let's say the first element on the stack, let's say it was this address. Rather than trying to print this as a string, it's saying, go to this memory address and then whatever's there, print it as a string. And if this doesn't point to anything valid, then we basically get back the, if that's not a valid memory address, should I say. So, if we did that, let's try and do that for the hundredth element. I'll do percentage, let's do a hundred and then dollar S. And there we actually got back something, right? So because, let's see what the first one was actually again. Do the first one, percentage P. Oh, okay, or maybe, maybe it was the second one. So percentage P, right. So if we try and do a dollar sign, oh sorry, if we try and do an S format specifier to print this as a string, it's basically gonna try and go to this address and print what's there as a string. And obviously this isn't a valid memory address, so we get segmentation fault. So if we wanted to print all of these strings off, then we could just loop through the, say 100 values or 200 values. And each time the program crashes, we just launch it again and we get the next element and anything that gives a segmentation fault, we don't print. So it's very easy to do that, to loop around and print those. Um, or we can just do the pointers like we did with the percentage P. And then you can go and find ones that look like they might be text and then just unhex them. So I don't know, did I have any examples of that? Um, we'll find some examples shortly. So for now, what I want to do is open up the exploit script that I put together. It's more like a fuzzing script, really. And this says connect to server, but I'm just doing process at the moment. But we could just go and change this to remote and then put in a server address and a port number whenever we're doing it remotely. But we're just doing it locally at the moment. Oh, we also need a flag.txt for this, by the way. So I just created a flag.txt. 
If you don't have, oh, that's not how you print a file. Uh, if you don't have a flag.txt, it'll basically come up with an error saying, have you forgotten the flag.txt? So I just made that in advance, but let's have a look at what the script's doing. So it asks us for a choice. We put in a choice, number five, and then we're sending off 30 times that pointer. And then we're just waiting for the input to, or for the output to come to us. And then we're going to read the whole response. We're going to go through and separate it by a space because there'll be a space in between each one of these. And then if it's not nil, we're going to try and decode it. So we need to change the endedness. We also need to convert it to text. And then we want to print it out. And we can just build it up if we want to try and get the flag as well. So let's just try and run it and see how it looks. Python exploit. So you can see we've got all these numbered. It's printing out all of the things on the stack. But it isn't giving us a flag. So we might want to just try and increment that. We could change this to 100. And we could also, if we wanted to just print out, let's do, let's print out the response and just take a look at it. So we'll do that again. Uh, oh, it didn't actually print out 100. Maybe we don't have enough space. But anyway, here's our pointers. So these are the hex values. So if we're not using a script, we're just doing this manually. Maybe we just run the program, we do this, and then we'd find something that looks like I'm trying to find something that looks like it's hex. These do, but they look like they're the spaces because we've got two zero as a space in hex. I'm not really seeing anything else interesting. I think these are just program values. Let me, let's give it a go. We can do unhex, paste that in. And yeah, that's just one of the program values. All right, well, we'll do this. This is going to be one of our inputs on the stack. So unhex, and there we'll see percentage P, space, P. Okay, so the ND in this hasn't been reversed. It's in reverse order. But yeah, that's basically some of our input. It's made it onto the stack, and then we've leaked it off of the stack. All right, so we've got no flag. What are we going to do next? Well, I'm going to open this up with Geardra so we can actually go and have a look at the code. We weren't provided the code with it. So this is one thing we could do. We could also use another tool like IDA, or we could try and open it up with GDB to dynamically debug it. Um, we could use Radair or something like that. Uh, I typically use Geardra and I've got a nice, well, I think it's a nicer theme for it now. At least it's not incredibly bright. We open it up, we're taken straight to the main function. We don't really have much looking around to do. And here we see the code. So what I normally like to do is go and start renaming some of these variables. And I'll do that with most of the variables until I understand what's going on. But in this case, it's just a couple that I want to focus on. For example, let's say we're limit on time, or maybe we just want to be the first person to solve this challenge. So if that's the case, then um, we would have lost by now because I've been recording, I think like 15 minutes. But um, yeah, let's say this is where the flag is open. So this is, let's say we can type L or we can right click it to rename. And this is the flag file pointer. All right. so. Where is that used then? And we go down here and we'll see it's actually used here. And this is calling fget. So we can highlight that and see what fget is doing. What it's doing is it's reading 40 bytes, that's hex, so it's 64 bytes. It's being read from the flag file pointer into that char pointer, into a pointer with a string. Which means then if this is being loaded into a pointer, we could also use that percentage s as long as we find out where it is. But we could also use the percentage p as well. But let's um, let's rename that to flag then, and then now we've got a better idea. So a flag was here. We also had this is the condition that's required. So it's saying equals five. Again, you can have a look and see whether it's used. But it looks like that's our menu option. So basically, if the menu option we provide is five, then it's going to read this flag. And we used five, but it didn't work. Now, because it starts at zero, the indices, that's actually not right. We want to use six and get the mysterious flag mat, which is, remember the description said that anything that's out of stock has been unlisted. Well, that's basically why we don't see that. So you could just play around with it to find that, or you could disassemble it like we have here. Maybe I should have put this to like one, three, three, seven, because some people might just try and do like one to 10. But that's fine. Let's go and give it a go. 
we could give it a go in the program or we can give it a go in our script. Why don't we just go and update the strip script and say, this is six instead of five. And then we do Python exploit, run through, and there we've got back our flag. We're going to have a look where it actually is here. So it's at 17, 18, 19, 20. And maybe we'll go and improve our script a little bit then. So let's take out this noise here where it's printing the response. And let us say, instead of getting, instead of sending off 100 percentage P, what we can say is send off percentage $18 P and a space. And then we'll do this a few times. And then we'll just update these indices. So 19, 20, 21. Now bear in mind this works here because we've just tested that locally, but when we do that against a remote server, it's likely to be different values. And it might also change because maybe other people are using the connection. There's other things getting added onto the stack and things like that. But for us, that's fine. We're able to just then grab the flag and print it out in a nice format. It also means we could just go and do that manually and we could have done this whole thing manually really. Uh, it just depends what you prefer. And to do that, we just run floor mats. We'd give the option six and then we paste that in and then we'd need to go and decode this. So you can unhex it and then reverse the string or you can go and put it into something like Cyberchef and change the endiness there and unhex it all in one go. All right, so finally, let's just take a look at the source code and see what was going on. So we had these six options, but whenever we were printing out the available options, it was only printing out five because one is supposed to be out of stock, which is this mysterious flag mat. Hopefully you get the idea now, the floor mat store is actually the format challenge. I don't, I'm, I'm assuming somebody has come up with that wordplay before. It seems extremely obvious, but I haven't seen it. So I'll take credit until somebody disputes otherwise. And yeah, it's going to go through. We know then that it opens the flag pointer up here. It's making sure we have the flag, but it doesn't actually load the flag into the flag variable unless we select the fifth index, which was the six option. And that's it. So it loads it in and then it's going to call this dangerous printf. So it's actually, I think it's coming up. Yep. It's saying there, this is potentially insecure because we're not specifying what format. So we're taking user input and we're allowing them to specify the format so they can put in things that are gonna leak things off the stack or they can use that percentage N as well so they can potentially write things to the stack as well. And yeah, that's basically it. Simple enough challenge. If you've watched my Pwn video series, you will have probably found a solution to this very quickly or if you're just used to doing Pwn challenges. And yeah, if you're interested in doing more Pwn stuff, um, you can check out my GitHub. I have a lot of resources here to help people with pwn challenges. I've also got a pwn category, which has like my solutions to the ROP Emporium, which I think is really good. Exploit Education, I did a few of those. And then the Binary Exploitation series. This is what I made on YouTube, which is like uh, 10 or 11 episodes, just going over the basics of how to inject shellcode and return to libc, format string vulnerabilities, all that sort of stuff. And you can get that video series here as well. But yeah, I hope you enjoyed this video anyway. And I hope you enjoyed the CTF and that everything went smoothly and we didn't have too many issues with the infrastructure. And if you have any feedback for next time, you can leave that in the comments and go ahead and vote on CTF time so we get a good weight in, hopefully, for the CTF. Uh, anyway, yeah, hope you enjoyed this video. Take care.